Good morning. Morning. Welcome to St. Mark's. Really good to see everyone here today. It's great to be able to have a little bit of sun after a wet and rainy week. Um, it's great to be able to see all the mixed services here. Just getting used to that again after several months. Uh, during the week, I was uh, reflecting with uh, my wife, Cell. I remember we had to uh, go to a, a, uh, a work sort of event. I remember around this time a couple of years ago. And she was making small talk with one of the medical professors uh, that I work with. And she brought up uh, the Star Wars movies that the, the, the sequels were on at the time. And he had never heard of Star Wars. He hadn't heard of anything about Star Wars. So it was a bit of a conversation ender. And we're just thinking about how do you introduce to someone something like Star Wars? We've always had the benefit of knowing all of it. So, you know, how do you, how do, you do that? And I remember reading maybe with interest, an article about how do you introduce Star Wars to your children? And they said, what order do you watch the movies? And so they said, do you do it in the chronological order which it's written? Do you do it according to how it was released? Or do you do, apparently, there's something called a machete order where you mix and match them up and you leave out the, the Phantom Menace because that was very boring, it wasn't very good. So how do, you, how do you watch it? And I was thinking about it with probably infinitely more gravitas this week when I was preparing for um, uh, our series on Isaiah. If you remember last week, we were left hanging with this idea of Judah being cut down and there was going to be left this remnant. And we know that we're going to be talking about this uh, stump of the shooter, Jesse. So I hope you guys are also looking forward to uh, reading more about the sequel, but also us having this benefit of hindsight or foresight that uh, the readers before didn't have. So please join me um, as we pray to start Dear God, our Father, when the set time had come, you sent your Son to redeem us so that we might receive adoption as your children. Because we are your children, you sent the Spirit of your Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So we are no longer slaves, but God's children and heirs. Thank you for giving us the privilege of knowing Christ through your word and being able to meet to read it and understand it and celebrate and praise it together. Amen. Let's stand and sing glory to the crown of crowns, our Lord Jesus. Oh 
Invigorating was that. We were praised with the full service today. We've come to a part of the service which is a little bit sad, um, but one that um, we've been very blessed uh, to, to be able to talk about. Um, so I'm going to consume family time by inviting um, Sarah up. Uh, thanks, Sarah. As you know, this is Sarah's last service with us, uh, sadly. Yeah, 
It's my last one. <laughs> it's a bit sad. It's a bit sad, but a we'll be very sad. blessed. Yeah. Um, I'll stay away from you. Yeah. So I was hoping to chat with you a little bit today, Sarah, to hear a little bit about your time at St. Mark's and also what you're going towards. So yeah. um, having chatted with you over time, I've been really struck by your zeal for God's word, but particularly um, your, your, your love with the children. What has driven you towards the kids' ministry? Yeah, well, I think it starts back when I was about five years old because I can still remember those who taught me the Bible in the kids' programs in my church from five through to eight years old, those leaders who set aside time to teach me the Bible stories. Um, it comes from natural gifts that God has given me to be a big kid. I like to get along with kids. I like to know what they like, uh, things like that. But as I've grown in my knowledge of God's word, of his desire to see all people saved, I think I see kids and this unique opportunity to love them well. Um, So you'll, you'll come to St. Mark's as well the last couple of years when we've had some really challenging times. You've had a change of minister, you've had uh, COVID and lockdown, probably yeah. in the people's stage during that time, and yet you've uh, maintained your ministry, you've hung out with us. Um, how has your ministry and service changed, um, if it has, over the last couple of years? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've definitely grown in my time here at St. Mark's. I think when you're faced with uh, many changes, the best you can do is try and adapt to them. Um, but I wasn't doing that alone. I was adapting and changing with all of you. I think I've learned a lot from the congregation and the family here at St. Mark's about the power of modeling ministry and of modeling our faith. I haven't been able to spend as much time with you all in person as I would have liked, but watching each of you contribute to this family, the way that you love and serve one another, that's changed the way that I've thought about my own ministry, the way that your witness can be a powerful uh, tool in spreading the gospel to other people. Um, so thank you for being a wonderful witness to me. Um, and it's taught me to be patient as I wait to see God's work. Um, yeah, I think you can come into a student ministry position and, and you want to be effective. You're only here for a short period of time. Two years is um, barely a breath, really, in the scheme of things. And you want to be effective and see changes straight away. But um, the best you can do is know people and love them. Um, and just learning to be patient with myself uh, over that time and watching, yeah, what, how the congregation has responded to changes has been really good. Yeah. Well, we sort of loved having you and we've certainly grown a lot um, through, through your work. I mean, I certainly as a, as a younger parent, parent of younger kids, not a young person, but um, I'm, uh, um, like I've, I've grown a lot. We've learned a lot from your talks, for example, and the way that you've taught our kids and so that modelling uh, we reflect as well. So thank you. Um, and where will you be moving to now? Yeah. Uh, well, immediately I'm moving to Dubbo uh, to spend time with my mum and dad and have a bit of downtime and rest over Christmas and New Year's. But around mid-Jan, I'm heading to Canberra, so the bush capital, uh, the freezing centre of Australia perhaps, but I'll be working with Crossroads Christian Church as a kids and youth pastor. So uh, on Sunday mornings, um, yeah, doing similar things to what I do here with St Mark's, but also working out how I can be part of the church family in the youth space during the week. So that's not yet worked out, but Canberra, kids and youth, that's where I'm heading. Yep. Fantastic. And what things can we pray for you? Yeah. Um, well, there's a lot of changes coming up over the next few months. Um, changes, yeah, usually pretty difficult to go through, but I guess I'd love prayer for patience. Um, patience with myself as I kind of process all the things going on. Patience with others who have to deal with me when I'm feeling, um, I don't know, tired or just angry about things that I can't control. And I'd love prayer that just in this first year out of college that I could continue to grow in my godliness, 
that even as full-time ministry and those responsibilities become part of my everyday life, that my love for God will only grow in the work that I'm doing. Yeah. Thanks very much, Sarah. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, we will pray for you. I'll get you to grab a seat for the moment. We were going to get um, a couple of people up uh, to also um, say a couple of things. Uh, so I was going to invite uh, Sophie and Rachel. And is uh, Claire here? Yep. Okay. So start with uh, Sophie and uh, Rach. Yep. Please. Yeah, what are you comfortable with? That's fine. Yeah, so it's been really awesome getting to know Sarah over um, this year. I've noticed multiple things. I love how Sarah, she's super down to earth, super genuine, easy to talk to. Um, I love that she has a passion for not just the Bible, but biblical history, which most people just brush off. But I love it and it's, she's shown how important it is. Um, and I love her heart for children. And for them to know our God. Um, something that's really stood out to me though is um, her faithfulness. No matter how tired she's been or how many things she's had to do with her studies and multiple commitments, she's always turned up, always um, provided resources for um, Sunday school. Yeah, and always just been faithful. So thank you, Sarah, and I wish you all the best. Hello. Um, I totally agree with um, what she has said. And <laughs> Sarah's amazing and she is a big kid. I can attest to that because I work with her at preschool. Um, and that's something I am learning from her too. It's been amazing seeing her make the kids laugh, teach the kids, you know, running around with them. And she's been a great mentor, very inspiring. And she is a um, wonderful uh, Bible study teacher as well. Um, I've learned a lot. I learned more how to understand the Bible and read it more clearly. It's been amazing, Sarah. Uh, we'll, you'll be missed, and um, all the best for your new church, and you'll definitely have more kids that are loving you too. Um, yeah, thank you, Sarah. Get yep. Um, Sarah is such an amazing teacher. And she is such an inspiring role model. She always explains everything with lots of description and care. And what I really love about her is that she doesn't stop describing and talking until everyone understands. And she has a lovely sense of humor. And we always look forward to have a laugh with her every week. And my personal favorite activity, activity that she's done is the cardboard one where she told a story and showed actions with the cardboard and I've had s and the groups have had so many unforgettable memories with her and we'll miss her so much but we won't forget any of the things she's taught us. Sarah is a wonderful person. She spreads, she spreads happiness wherever she goes. Sarah is very talented. She is an excellent teacher. She is the best. Sarah is always positive at all times. She is extremely funny. I love being in 3 to 5. I will never forget her. I hope she visits us sometime. Or even better, I hope she comes back soon. <laughs> we will miss you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah, for looking after me and reading books. And we've got a few more on video. So thanks very much, Simon. Hi Sarah, thank you so much for teaching us at church about God and Jesus. I really enjoyed the talks that you gave us. Wherever you're going to go next, I think you are going to do great. 
also Merry Christmas. See ya. Thank you, Auntie Sarah, for doing the ABC uh, Isaiah. Auntie Sarah, Auntie Tina's at Church. Thank you, Sarah, for teaching me the Bible like the man who has leprosy. And thank you for making everything fun like Halloweening. And I'm going to miss you as my Sunday school teacher. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for doing a wonderful job coordinating it. Kids Church and Sig Marks. I really enjoyed the worksheet you created during our three months of lockdown. Even though we couldn't attend church, it was nice to be able to continue our series on Galatians and Psalms. Your kids talks are also very clear and easy to understand. Thanks for sharing Jesus with us. We we'll miss you. Dear Sarah, thank you for all you have done for us in St. Mark's. We love you and all the best in Canberra. Thank you. Sarah, thank you, Auntie Sarah. For teaching me. For teaching me. In Kids Church. In Kids Church. And helping me calling in at Kids Church and doing. Thank you for teaching us in lockdown. We are all going to miss you. We hope we settle into your new church quickly. I'm going to pray for Sarah. Dear Lord, thank you that you gave us Sarah and that she teached us during lockdown. Help her to settle in to her new church in Canberra. Amen. So thank you very much, Sarah. You can see uh, you have really been a, a great part with us as part of our family, um, and we do really w we wish you the best. Uh, thank you very much to all the parents um, and the kids who've uh, spent the time um, and also the IT guys pulling that together uh, for us as well. Um, please join me and we'll pray for Sarah now. Dear Lord, thank you for raising up Sarah to serve you. We have been so grateful for her sacrificial love and ministry over the last two years at St Mark's. We pray thanks for Sarah's fervour for your word, making Christ known and her learning, growth, planning and thoughtfulness in teaching all of us, kids and adults, with clear godly messages. Thank you for helping Sarah maintain equanimity and ingenuity through the challenges of the past two years. We pray for patience. We pray for a safe and smooth move to Canberra and that Sarah will face the challenges, both logistics as well as being part of a new, new, new church, and that she'll be welcomed and grow in friendships and fellowship with uh, her new church at Canberra. Amen. I will send the kids off to uh, their last uh, uh, school with uh, Sarah. Invite Anja up to read. The sermon Bible reading is from Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 10. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes, or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the needy, with justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. There will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, 
for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. Uh, reading from Revelation 1, um, verse 12 to 18. I turn around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstamps, and among the lampstamps was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like brown, bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then... He, he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and hates. Thank you for all those speeches for Sarah. Um, it was very warming, I think, to see how much Sarah is appreciated by our congregation. She has been a good level head for us. This morning when she came, I said to her, well, this is your last Sunday, it's all about you. And she quickly corrected me and said, no, it's all about Jesus. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Sarah, for your ongoing corrections. I know she can't hear. She's doing her job, which is in Sunday school, uh, where she's uh, served us so well. I think that's the thing with Sarah. A lot of her work has been unseen. And it's been, uh, she's very, very organised. And we've had great programs here. And uh, it, uh, communication has been really clear. Uh, and it's been um, a wonderful way that she served our congregation. Our children are so important to us, aren't they? Uh, and so uh, we really appreciate what Sarah has done for us. I wonder if we've got the sound right. I'm going to be preaching for, you know, about 20 minutes. So is that uh, okay? It's hopefully it's uh, all right. That sounds all right, Edgar, I think. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I'll um, open in prayer. I think uh, there's probably been a lot of fallback coming through all the... So if you've got all the microphones muted, that would be helpful. Yeah. Um, loving Father, we thank you for Sarah. Thank you for the small celebration that we've had this morning and we look forward to the potluck lunch together. Uh, we thank you for our student ministers and the way that they work in the background. We pray, Lord, that this would be a good uh, training church for them, mainly because that they would be loved here. And, uh, Lord, they'd have relationships, good, encouraging relationships with the people here. Father, we... Uh, we pray as we look at your word this morning, we pray, Father, that um, you would correct our vision of Jesus, that you would lift our vision of Jesus, that we would know him fully and that we would know uh, who he is and, and his power and his might and his justice and the spirit of the Lord which is upon him, that we may follow him confidently uh, and, Lord, that you would... Uh, build our faith up this morning through the exercise as we, as we look at the scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I wonder if you could imagine a world without competitive politics. So no how to vote cards, uh, none of those posters with the vote one and the smiling face looking at us on Anzac Parade, uh, no uh, campaigns or um, 
uh, I'm better than you type of speeches. It, it would be a real breath of fresh air. On, on the negative side, uh, we'd, we wouldn't have um, democracy sausage sizzles, would we? And that would be a pity. We'd really miss that. How is it possible? How is it possible to have leaders without elections? Well, I think uh, we all know that the answer is through dynastic reign. We could have that in Australia, couldn't we? A dynasty. Uh, that is, uh, one leader dies and a person of the same family is given the honour of the number one position. And when he or she dies, the next person in line takes over. No vault voting, no polling and no choosing. Proponents of dynastic monarchies, and there are some around, uh, say it's better for long-term change and improvement because the leader doesn't have to spend the three years he's in office convincing people to vote for him for another three years. To be fair, sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. Uh, the longest surviving is the Yamato dynasty that has ruled Japan since 7th century BC. Uh, that's an impressive amount of time. I, I am still ringing here, Edgar. Are we better to use a different microphone. Or we'll get. See how we go with this. That's better, isn't it? So, yeah, excellent. A little bit of a change. I feel more comfortable now. Um, I wonder if you're aware of one of the most unsuccessful dynasties, which is the Habsburg dynasty, the German Habsburg dynasty. Uh, some of you may have heard about them. They, uh, their reign goes back to the 11th century AD, but they ran into problems due to inbreeding. Uh, in other words, they wanted to keep it in the family. Um, the, uh, the results of inbreeding are large chins, known as the Hasberg jaw, but also infertility. For infer many people suffer from infertility, but it doesn't work well if you want a dynasty. You have to have offspring. Uh, the situation became so bad that Charles II was his own cousin, if you can work that one out. Isaiah 11 turns to hope. The previous chapters spelt judgment in the form of an axe, Assyria, and from the felled forest would rise a stump, a stump of Jesse, a ruler, from a specific family, a dynasty. So this is a stump that will bear good fruit in contrast to the vineyard that produced only bad fruit. This ruler will be anointed to lead and after the failed leadership of Saul, the Lord had determined a new dynasty. Only a son of Jesse would be the legitimate ruler. And David, son of Jesse, was promised by the Lord a throne that would endure forever. Isaiah has already whet our appetite with uh, different information about this ruler, a son, Emmanuel, chapter 7, a child, a wonderful counsellor, mighty God, of whom the greatness of his government will have no end, Isaiah chapter 9. And now we learn that he will rule in a different way, perhaps a way that they had not experienced in the past as we look at Isaiah chapter 11. So please have your Bibles open. There are Bibles around the room. There are Bibles that you bring with you. There are laptops. There are phones. Any way you can look at the Scriptures, please do this morning as we look at this together. Because what I like to do is when I bring a message is not just tell you what it says, but have us all engage with the message and read it together. So... Uh, if, we, uh, if you wouldn't mind putting that up on the screen, Simon, this is my outline. Isaiah 11, the stump of Jesse. Three points. Firstly, he will fear the Lord, verses 2 to 3. We're talking about Isaiah chapter 11. Secondly, he will judge the needy, verses 3 to 4. And thirdly, he will strike the earth, verses 4 to 5. The first quality is a relationship with the Lord the second, relationship with those in need, and the third, his relationship with the world. So firstly, he will fear the Lord. Surely, this is the number one quality of God's leader, uh, that he would fear the Lord. However, it was the number one failure of many of Judah's leaders. In Isaiah chapter 8, we read, The Lord Almighty 
is the one that you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. It's only human to fear. Threats abound and fear precedes action, which is a response to those fears. Have you ever lost your breath as you saw a child running toward Anzac Parade or a busy road? Has your face ever become numb, that sheet of numbness that comes over your face when a car turns in front of you and you narrowly avoid an accident? Has your pulse rate ever gone up when you've experienced turbulence in an aeroplane and you wonder to yourself, how much can those rivets in the wings uh, endure? Will this plane rattle to our death? That's fear. And you may have experienced fear at different times. It can be explained by a release of adrenaline and cortisol from your adrenal gland. It's your body telling you to wake up and engage with whatever is the object of that fear, whatever is threatening you. The kings of Judah had identified the wrong threat. Assyria was merely the presenting problem. Their real problem was their relationship with the Lord. And this had been Isaiah's continuous message. The source of the king's inability to fear the Lord was their spirit. They had a spirit of pride and rebellion, which led them to trust in human strength rather than the Lord's might. The failed king of Isaiah's time, Ahaz, had the right ancestry. He was a descendant of Jesse, but he had the wrong spirit. Compare his spirit of rebellion to the spirit of the promised ruler in verse, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Jesus' leadership was dominated by the Spirit. The Gospel of Mark records the moment when the Spirit descended on him like a dove, which sounds like a great movie scene, but it was a wonderful picture, a wonderful uh, object of symbolism to show us that Jesus, that the Spirit of the Lord rested upon Jesus. Jesus told the woman at the well that uh, his followers would worship in spirit and truth and that he would bring the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Gospel writers point not only to Jesus' power in calming the sea, casting out demons and healing the sick, but the manner in which he did things. He showed true wisdom and understanding and knowledge of the Lord. This characterised his rule. And he feared the Lord. And as he said, the Father and I are one in John chapter 10. And the voice from heaven declared that Jesus is God's son with whom he is well pleased. So Jesus had the spirit upon him and he feared the Lord. Secondly, he will judge the needy. I wonder if we can uh, come to the second point there. Thank you, Simon. He will judge the needy. You probably aren't expecting that. You would probably expect him to judge the wicked and be kind to the needy. However, we read in verse 4, if you have your Bibles there, verse 4, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions to the poor on the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips. He will slay the wicked. People often think that it's a bad thing to be judged, but the scriptures see justice as a good thing. It's a bad thing to be judged unfairly, but it's a good thing to be judged in righteousness. Usually, this is the greatest problem that the poor and needy have. They have been unfairly judged. A system of injustice has led to their circumstances of need and poverty and becoming marginalised. I mean, isn't that what the needy are crying out in this, for in this world? Don't you hear people crying out for justice? In the US, 
African Americans make up 13% of the population, yet 41% of those on death row are African American. Whether it's social circumstances or faulty justice system, you're more likely to be let down by the justice system if you are African American. That's not just the US. We only need to look at here at home. Aboriginals make up only 3% of our population, yet 28% of our prison population. A failed justice system is partly to blame, along with other things. And I'm not saying that the US and Australia are the only countries in the world with uh, justice problems. If these two countries have problems with all protections in place, if they've failed, then consider what the rest of the world must be like. In most parts of the world, the poor and the marginalised suffer and they call for justice. The human justice system has failed. Only a leader who has the spirit of counsel will, uh, and might will be able to judge fairly. The modern-day woke movement continually beats out the message that those in power have to do a better job at looking out for the needs of the poor and ensuring a fairer justice system for all. There's nothing wrong with that message. Injustice shows the moral bankruptcy of the world. But I want to put to you that there's a better message, a better solution. It's not a message about the flawed human leaders and what they should do about injustice. It's about what the Lord will do through his appointed leader, Jesus Christ. Jesus will provide justice, not just by berating the secular leaders or protesting, but by silently going to the cross like a lamb to the slaughter. But his silence will not last forever. And this brings me to the third point that he will strike the earth. Verse 4, he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips. He will slay the wicked. So, how do you deal with the wicked has been the subject of Isaiah. Judah's kings have rejected the Lord. Assyria is a rising empire that threatens to dethrone the Lord's king. The northern neighbours are menaces, but wickedness will not prevail. The Messiah comes to restore righteousness to the earth, not just to Judah, but to the entire earth. And he will do it, not with a common arsenal of warfare, chariots and arrows, but with his word. With his word, the Lord made the world. We read in Psalm chapter 33, verse 6, many people think that the only... A creation account is in Genesis 1, but here's a great one in Psalm 33. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry hosts, by the breath of his mouth. There's a creation account. And with his word, he judges and condemns the earth. The picture here is not of a leader struggling to gain control, but one with whom there is no doubt as to whom is in control. In Revelation, the Apostle John has a vision of Christ in heaven, the throne room of God. And Claire just read that out, of the marvellous vision of the Christ in the throne room, mighty and powerful. And another one in Revelation chapter 19, where we've got this description. Coming from his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule with an iron scepter. His word, with his word, he sat, settles the matter matter once for all and disposes of all that wages against him and his people. This is a vision of Christ's return in the future and we can see that he's not sitting around waiting. He battles for the dominion of hearts and minds today through his word, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see, in the end, the most powerful thing in the world is his word and that's uh, a reason why we study his word so powerful. We're dealing with something that's incredibly um, potent and uh, penetrates the world, the hearts and minds, the hearts and minds of people sitting here. And the, as the gospel's proclaimed around the world, uh, people 
turn to him. You want to see power, then let's proclaim the word. And the end result is described in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples and the nations will rally to him and his resting place will be glorious. So here we see the magnetic force of all world history, final peace and rest for all the nations under the headship of Christ. The plan is being wrapped up and we are now in the final stages. So we're left asking, do you belong to the past or to the future? According to Isaiah 11, those who fear human threats belong to the past. Those who fear the Lord belong to the future. The wicked belong to the past. The righteous to the future. Those who ignore God's chosen king belong to the past. Those who rally to him belong to the future. So today we learn three things about Christ from a prophecy written about him 700 years before his birth. The spirit of the Lord is upon him. He will judge in righteousness and by his word, by the mouth, the word of his mouth, the breath of his tongue, he will slay the world. So, this is what I suggest we do with this information. If the Spirit of the Lord is upon him, what should you do? You should follow him. He is the true leader of God's people. He is of the true family lineage, Jesse, and the true spirit. He has full knowledge that will lead us to, to glory. And once again, the scriptures assure us that we are on the right track if we follow Jesus and not the powers of this temporal world. And when we follow him, our doubts fade, our hopes rise, and our future comes into focus. So, if the Spirit of the Lord is upon him, we should follow him. Secondly, if he judges with righteousness, then we should entrust ourselves to him. Christ is both our judge and the one who takes our penalty for our sin. He will bring, uh, we will bring all our failure and all our sin to the cross. This, that is, that we will have faith that it was dealt there once for all and we leave it in the past. It need no longer torment threat, or threaten us with death. At the cross, we are forgiven and justified through him. And thirdly, if he will strike the earth with his mouth, then we should fear him. He will come again in power. It will be a time of reckoning. The majority will be condemned, but the minority will be saved. And the simple test as to whether you're condemned or saved will be the question, who is your king? Who is your king? The only acceptable answer will be Jesus the Christ, the descendant of Jesse. He is my king. Did you know that George Washington was asked to be the king of the United States? It was a proposal that he was repulsed by and he shut it down as quickly as he could. He wrote, I must view it with abhorrence and reprehend with severity. Beside the idea of a monarch, a, monarch, a dynasty in the US would have caused immediate confusion. Why? Because George Washington didn't have any children. What would have happened? Who would have inherited the crown after he died? That would have been great, isn't it? You just start a dynasty and then it ends with one generation. He did have stepchildren and he did adopt them, but he didn't have any from his seed. Well, I should point out that neither did Jesus. He didn't have children. So who was the king after him? Jesus is not only the 
final descendant of Jesse, he is the fulfillment of the shoot that would come from the stump of Jesse. Jesus is the final and everlasting king, and he didn't need descendants because he lives forever. He rose to life and he reigns at his father's right hand side and he will come again in power to judge the living and the dead. He is the everlasting king. William Carey wrote that the future is as bright as the promises of God. I like that. God promised a king that would finally fear the Lord, judge in righteousness and strike the earth with the power of his word. God fulfilled that promise in Christ. And so we sing, All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Loving Father, we pray that you would be crowned in our lives, that we'd recognise the, uh, the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ and that we'd submit to his rule, that we'd follow him, we'd entrust ourselves to him and that we would fear him and that we would proclaim uh, his might and his word so that people may fall before him and repent while they can before they be destroyed at the final coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we commit uh, our ministry to you and uh, we pray, Father, that you would be building up our faith day after day, that we'd be um, increasing in our faith, uh, that our doubts would fade away and that our hope would rise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're now going to sing, so invite the, uh, the song leaders to come out the front and um, please stand and join in this song, uh, which is... Uh, they'll know. They'll announce it. He, it is finished, yes. Death and sin was conquered when Jesus died on the cross. How I love the voice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. He declared his work is finished. He has spoken this hope to me. Though the sun has ceased its shining, though the war appeared as lost, Christ had triumphed over evil. It was finished upon that cross. Now the curse, it has been broken. Jesus paid the price for me. Full the pardon he has offered. Great the welcome that I receive. Boldly I approach my Father, clothed in Jesus' righteousness. There is no more guilt to carry, it was finished upon that cross. Death was once my great opponent, fear once had a hold on me. But the Son who died to save us rose that we would be free indeed. Death was once my great opponent. Fear once had a hold on me, but the Son who died to save us 
rose that we would be free indeed. Yes, he rose that we would be free indeed. Free from every plan of darkness. Free to live and free to love. Death is dead and Christ is risen. It was finished upon the cross. Oh, to eternal glory, to my Savior and my God, I rejoice in Jesus' victory. It was finished upon that cross. It was finished upon that cross. It was finished upon that cross. Hi, church. I'm just going to be praying from uh, the list of prayer points on our newsletter last week, or the one that was sent on Friday, so please join me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise and thank you for sending your son Jesus down to earth. We praise him that he is the promised Messiah from the shoot that, well, the, the, the shoot that came from the stump of Jetsy, who is called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. And as Christmas approaches and as the world celebrates this season, may the gospel be taught faithfully and powerfully so that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. Father, we pray that you may help us here at St Mark's grow in our zeal for your name. Help us to collectively and faithfully proclaim and admonish and teach everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. Help us to recognise the privilege and joy in prayer and that we may all be prayerful on all occasions and with all kinds of prayers and requests. Help us to be alert and always be praying for the Lord's people. Father, we think of our brothers and sisters in our church here who are sick or suffering at the moment. You, Lord, are the great physician who is able to heal all diseases and we ask that you may restore them and relieve them from their suffering. Please help us as a church to function as your hand and feet and mouthpiece, to love one another enough to reach out to our struggling brothers and sisters in Christ and to encourage them by bearing each other's burdens together. Thank you, Father, that Friday Playgroup had just celebrated um, our Christmas party last week. Thank you for the opportunity that this ministry allows us to connect uh, to local parents and children in our community. Thank you for the friendship that has been established with one of the mums named Juliana. We pray for Juliana, who, um, yeah, we pray that your Holy Spirit be stirring her heart so that she may grow in curiosity to know more about Jesus. Lord, we pray for the work of Anglicare and Dorothy Boyd House. We pray that not only is your name to be honoured through the ministries that are run in these organisations, but also that through these ministries, that it may bear fruit in the residences, um, growing in their knowledge and faith in Jesus. Father, we pray for Christians in troubled parts of the world who are thrust into predicaments and face dangers from government officials or even from their own family members just because they call on the name of Jesus. Please let your presence be felt and known by them. Please let your peace that surpasses understanding rest on them and help them to stand firm in their faith despite the hostility that they face. 
Father, we also pray for missionaries who serve in remote territories or foreign lands. We acknowledge that we are all but jars of clay, easily breakable and replaceable. But you, Father, please enable and empower your servants with spiritual vigour and faith that they will not be shaken by isolation, difficulty or danger. Please help them to continue to look towards Jesus to find peace, hope and comfort. Please give them ample strength to persevere and please allow their ministries to be fruitful and to multiply. We pray, Lord, that you may raise up more and more people to go into your harvest field and please allow a great multitude to be won into your kingdom. Father, for all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Sylvia. And please uh, continue to join me in prayer with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, we learn today that we shouldn't fear our earth relationships, but fear the Lord, and we should all hail the King Christ. Let's stand and sing our last song, giving praise and glory to our God. And glorify our Lord, the Father of the Lord. In Christ he has in heavenly realms his blessings on us poor. For pure and blameless in his sight, he destined us to be. And now we've been adopted through his Son eternal. of your glory, to the praise of your mercy and grace, to the praise of your glory, you are the God who saves. Come praise and glorify our God, who gives his grace in Christ, in him our sins are washed away. Redeemed through sacrifice. In Him, God has been known to us the mystery of His will. And Christ should be the head of all His purpose to fulfill. Praise of your glory.
gives us grace in Christ. In him our sins are washed away, redeemed through sacrifice. In him God has made known to us the mystery of his will, that Christ should be the head of all he purposed to fulfil. Our dearest God, may we all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let us fear our Lord, not our earthly relationships, and know that he will judge the needy with justice beyond what our human systems can achieve. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid before your eyes. To him we must give account. To the praise of your glory, to the praise of your mercy and grace, to the praise of your glory, you are the God who saves. Amen. We're going to go straight into our lunch. So if you can all lend a hand uh, to pack stuff up and we'll get things set up. Um, and just a reminder over the next uh, month that uh, on Christmas Eve, it's up on the board, the service is 6 p.m. and then Christmas Day, 8.30 and 9.30. I uh, hope you can join us uh, for lunch today at Fairwell, Sarah. Thank you.